Welcome to our Clinicians in Conversation podcast series, part of the NIHR National Institute for Health Research podcast program. In this episode, you will hear from Professor Tariq Iqbal, National Specialty Lead for Gastroenterology at NIHR Clinical Research Network, and Dr. Tariq Ahmad, Consultant Gastroenterologist and member of the NIHR Gastroenterology National Specialty Group. Dr. Ahmad is also Chief Investigator for Clarity IBD. They will be discussing highlights from the Clarity IBD study, the results and delivery highlights, plus key learning points. Hi, so I'm, I'm uh, Tariq Iqbal. I'm a gastroenterologist in Birmingham and National Service Lead for uh, the NIHR Gastroenterology uh, Group. Uh, and it's a great pleasure today to be talking to my colleague, um, Dr. Ahmed, who's going to, uh, I think, introduce himself now. Hello, Tarek Ahmed. I'm a consultant gastroenterologist in Exeter in Devon. Great. Well, it's it's a real pleasure and uh, uh, to talk to you today, Tarek, about your um, um, wonderful uh, Clarity IBD study, which uh, uh, is probably the most important gastroenterology study. Well, it is the most important gastroenterology study undertaken during the recent COVID uh, pandemic. Um, it was a huge list logistical exercise, uh, and it, it's great to hear from you about uh, how you went about delivering it and some of the highlights. So um, over to you, really. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. So um, as many of you will know, Clarity IBD uh, is a UK NIHR COVID-19 urgent public health study investigating the impact of um, biologic and immunomodulated drugs, which we use commonly in IBD, on uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection risk and immunity, whether that follows infection uh, or vaccination. And it is now a prospective 64-week observational study. It was initially set out as a 40-week study, which is following 7,000 people with IBD treated with either infliximab, an anti-TNF drug, or vedolizumab. Uh, and uh, vedolizumab is uh, a gut-selective anti-integrin monoclonal antibody which, in contrast to uh, anti-TNF, is not associated with increased susceptibility to systemic infection or attenuated responses to vaccines. So the vedolizumab treated patients were the control group. And we recruited these 7,000 patients from 92 UK hospitals in just uh, 12 weeks, uh, a remarkable uh, feat. And this wouldn't have been possible without the infrastructure of the NIHR. So it's a really important question, isn't it, asked to, 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 uh, to address whether these very common and powerful immunosuppressants we use have a, 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 a detrimental impact on the, uh, on the vaccine um, uh, uh, in terms of the immunity development. Uh, when did you come up with it? When did you think about it? That's, uh... Well, uh, as you will remember, uh, March uh, 2020 was a frightening time for us. It was an even more... Uh, a worrying time for our patients uh, and um, uh, for our patients lockdown really meant lockdown and, uh, we, and and based on government guidance many of our patients were told to shield um, but of course this was based on very little data in terms of risk and so we felt that the it was important to try and work out uh, the risk uh, to patients from the therapies they were receiving and essentially this plan was put together in the space of a few evenings uh, with a group of uh, six or seven UK gastroenterologists, we came together to write a pragmatic protocol um, that allowed us to uh, follow patients when they attended for routine clinical uh, visits uh, in infusion units in UK hospitals. And of course, this, this is building on, on the, the wonderful platform you developed already, isn't it, on, on in, in terms of uh, monitoring biologics? Uh, you, you... Absolutely. So I think uh, the reason that we were able to get this study up and running quickly was because we'd already established uh, a network of sites across the UK. Uh, uh, so we had the contacts in terms of principal investigators and uh, research nurses, and we were able to call on them uh, to get up and running. But I think uh, the support of the NIHR through the Urgent Public Health Badge meant that we were able to establish this project and roll it out quicker than we've done any previous uh, multi-site work. 
Yeah, that was very impressive. So it really, I mean, how, how long did it take from the, you know, thinking about it in the bath or, or whatever to actually getting it on the road? It was very fast, wasn't it, to actually set it up? Yeah, so f um, from completion of uh, first draft of the protocol, which was the middle of May, to first patient recruited in the beginning of September. Uh, and we, uh, I, I guess we could have done it quicker, um, but there were some funding issues that we obviously needed to address first of all. Yeah. So would you, would you like to um, uh, give us some sort of key highlights and some pragmatic pointers from the study, sure. Derek, yeah. please? Uh, well, in terms of results, first of all, a, a brief word about those. We, uh, it, our first data came uh, one back before the vaccine, uh, and we first demonstrated that infliximab is associated with attenuated responses to the SARS-CoV-2 infection, despite similar rates of uh, symptomatic and proven uh, infections uh, compared to uh, as vedlizumab treated patients. And then we then followed the patients after vaccination, and we, we reported that after both one and two doses of vaccine, antibody concentrations were uh, uh, lower, but also less durable uh, in infliximab compared to vedlizumab treated patients, irrespective of whether they received the Pfizer or the AstraZeneca vaccine. Importantly, what we've shown very recently is that patients treated with infliximab also experienced a 50% increase in breakthrough infections after vaccination. But fortunately, only 1% of these breakthrough infections have resulted in hospitalization. So patients on these medicines, on anti-TNF drugs, shouldn't be too concerned. Um, but you know, based on our data, we've recommended that patients on anti-TNF should be prioritized for the third dose. So of course, they are uh, now anyway. So in terms of the delivery highlights, um, um, I, I've already mentioned that um, the speed of site setup and patient recruitment, I think, was unprecedented, certainly in terms of inflammatory bowel disease studies, uh, and that was down to the urgent public health bench. The second point I wanted to highlight was that um, uh, this has been a dynamic study, and we've added new objectives to the study as the pandemic has evolved and vaccines have been rolled out. And I think we're very grateful that the HRA approval process uh, was also accelerated uh, so that uh, major amendments came through in two or three days. And previously, we were waiting for weeks, if not months, for these uh, uh, approvals to be granted. Also important to highlight the fact that um, we have used uh, a REDCap database and been granted permission to hold personal data for individual subjects. And this has allowed us to reach out to patients directly with our questionnaires and also to link data uh, to nationally held PCR testing and vaccine uh, information. So that's that's been really key. Uh, it's also allowed us to push out results for patients. So we've been rolling out antibody test results to patients uh, in real time. And uh, we, we did some work at the beginning and, and uh, identified that patients really want to know their results. E the significance of the results is not completely understood. Um, so uh, uh, that, that was certainly new. Um, uh, in terms of uh, support, we, we used nurse PIs in lots of the centres uh, and also SPR uh, PIs, uh, which proved, I think, popular at sites and uh, also allowed us to reach sites that had previously not engaged with our work. So that, 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 that was key. Another uh, important aspect, uh, Tarek, was that um, um, you will remember that during the pandemic, uh, subcutaneous vedlizumab and infliximab became available. Previously, it was all intravenous. And um, this meant that some of our patients were not coming into hospital. It was good for them because they weren't coming near COVID uh, affected hospitals, but it was bad for the study uh, because uh, mm. uh, in terms of uh, uh, allowing us to, to uh, sample them. And um, so we developed a home uh, capillary blood testing kit uh, that meant that people could stay in the study and um, conduct their own blood tests and send them in the post to us uh, in Exeter. So that's, I think that's fantastic. It, it, um, you know, despite the sort of uh, uh, tragedy that we, we, we had in this pandemic, uh, there have been some bright spots, haven't there? I mean, you've been able to be very agile 
Um, obviously, you've got a track record of, of, of pretty rapid delivery anyway, but the system seems to have made things very streamlined in this case, and you've been able to uh, um, develop your ideas uh, uh, almost as quickly as, as they're conceived, which has uh, uh, been a very useful uh, uh, learning exercise for, from, I think, from, from COVID for the, the way we carry out these sort of multi-center research trials. So, I mean, what, what have you learned? I mean, what, 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 uh, what, what have you learned from what, where we were two years ago? What, what, can, what, have we, what has this experience taught us about delivering these sort of studies, do you think, going forward? What should we keep? Well, uh, I think there's a number of elements that we would definitely want to keep. I think, first of all, um, Teams, Microsoft Teams has been an essential uh, uh, way to communicate with patients uh, uh, and and with uh, the study management group and also with individual sites. And I think one of the key things that we've done is to engage the sites by holding regular uh, site update calls uh, where we've um, we've discussed problems, uh, we shared data as soon as it's available uh, and sought feedback from sites. And I think one of the problems, particularly when you're running an investigator-led study, is that often focus is taken off your study onto commercial type research. And so you have to keep sites interested. You have to remind them that we're still here, still looking for patients, so still need to keep them in the study. And so Teams has been invaluable. Um, and um, I, I think we should definitely keep that. Um, so we've had Teams meetings every two to three weeks on a lunchtime uh, half an hour to an hour slot, and it's worked well. The other uh, thing that I think that we've uh, uh, done is we have also maintained contact with our patients. Um, and uh, this has been through um, uh, Twitter, uh, through uh, email, we've released a video, um, and, um, and various newsletters have, have uh, been produced. And I think these have been uh, reasonably well received. Um, and uh, certainly we've had lots and lots of emails such that we've had to employ somebody to uh, respond to all the uh, participant uh, emails. But um, having that engagement has been helpful. Also, I think incentivizing the patient. So we're giving them something back in terms of their data uh, has been uh, important. What else would we do? Let the patients uh, collect the data. They do a good job of it. We found. So, Tarek, did 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 you did you say that you um, um, were able to uh, get associate PIs going in this in this program? Is that something that, or or, or did you not so have time to do that? The study was actually that? set up, uh, I think, a month or two too early for the uh, the associate PI scheme. But despite that, we did manage. Some of the uh, uh, principal investigators at sites decided that they would allow their registrars to run. The project on their behalf as sort of sub PIs, and that that happened. I mean, whether they were, I, I don't think they were officially designated as associate PIs because we weren't eligible uh, because we'd already opened when the scheme started. I mean, uh, that, that's obviously going to be something yeah, which, is, which we uh, we would like to develop in the future, certainly. Great. So, so um, where to? I mean, are are you gonna are you ambitious to continue this through the sort of uh, six monthly uh, booster programs that, we, that, that we're going to engage in in, in in the near future. Are, are you going to uh, extend this this uh, data so, collection? Um, Tarek, yes, we we um, have funding and uh, permission to extend the study for a further twenty four weeks. And um, the aim of this is to look at antibody and T cell responses to a third dose. Um, we are particularly interested in those patients who don't appear to have mounted an antibody response to two doses, and there's a small proportion of patients who either haven't mounted any response or have lost, very rapidly lost response. Uh, so we're interested in following these patients uh, for a longer period of time. We also have uh, some other uh, spin-off projects um, uh, that we plan to do in the next 24 weeks. Um, one of which is looking at long COVID in the IBD population, and a second project uh, looking at chronic nasopharyngeal carriage uh, in patients on these medicines. Well, thank you very much. That's very exciting, and uh, you know, as ever, congratulations. And uh, if I speak for the National Gastroenterology Group, we we're uh, excited to continue to uh, work and be led by you uh, in these these uh, large data projects. So, thank you very much. 
To find out more about how the NIHR supports gastroenterology research, visit the NIHR website. This was an episode of the NIHR Clinicians in Conversation podcast series. Thank you for listening.